In this edition, we've got some fantastic layouts to share with you, including some that have been in operation for decades. As for prototypes, we'll take you to some absolutely amazing railroad destinations and explore great equipment from the past and present. And of course, we all strive to add realism and detail to our layouts. So we'll share some secrets and techniques that will help you make your operation look more authentic. And when you see this graphic, pay attention because it tells you the name of a computer file stored on this DVD, including additional details and techniques for creating and improving your layout. Let's get rolling as we bring the action, power, and creativity of model railroading to life in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. The concept that I used in developing the Great Southern is quite different than the other railroads that I've built in model form. Uh, I've always built the rural type or the mountain type model railroad, and I wanted to get involved in a uh, complex industrial type scene. And we're primarily interested in the city. The concept is operationally a bridge line that runs between abilities, which are not uh, usually seen on model railroads. You don't see the desert type territories model very often. I selected O-Scale because it is a more difficult scale to build a large complex railroad in. Uh, I looked for a challenge. I love the size, the heft, the weight, uh, the equipment tracks better, and it also is easier to maintain because it's simply larger. And that can become important uh, if, you <laughs> if you get a little older and your eyesight begins to have some problem with it. Uh, the scenes that we'll see as you go around the, the layout, uh, you'll start in San Antonio, and it's San Antonio on a sort of warm, muggy September evening, 1955. And we roll around the layout, leaving the city. You'll pass the engine terminal, the freight yards, the industrial buildings, the suburban industrial buildings, and finally out on the main line heading west. First little town you come to is Uvalde, Texas. The next town would be Carter Valley, which is a little grain town or the high plateau in West Texas right before you reach the, uh, the Pecos River. Then on into uh, a, a fictitious town named after a friend of mine, Elvie, E-L-V-E-Y. It's kind of an unusual little town. Lots of uh, oil activity there. Then on to Sanderson, which is an actual town in West Texas. And it's out on the, the sort of high desert plain. And then you start up grade, and we come to Hale Center, Chataway, Moody, and on into Van Horn. I've used selective compression techniques for the same purposes that most other model railroads have used. You'll notice that the buildings, while being very tall, are oftentimes either very shallow in depth or very narrow in width. Because in this scale, an actual 20-story building would go right through this ceiling. So you bring this stuff down. What you try to capture is the essence or the character of the building or the structure or the mountain or whatever you're trying to, to get. And you look at its vertical lines, you look at its horizontal lines, and you start reducing it in segments. If you've done your job right, no one can tell that you have compressed it, so to speak. The wireless cab control that we use here is a very unusual type of control for model railroads. To my knowledge, it was the first that was ever used. It is based on infrared. The infrared is essentially similar to the television control you use to remote, uh, on, off, etc. But there was an enormous difference, a range. Plus, we had to have some type of receiving device that could sort out the signals received by this coated light that you see, chopped up much like a barcode on a, on a product at the grocery store. But to have eight or nine or 10 or 16 of those codes all being sent at once so that you can have eight or nine or 10 or 16 trains running around, that was the trick. So the safeguards and parity checks completely eliminated uh, existing technology as, as being practical. We had to invent everything. As long as the light can see the receiver and the receiver can see the light, and there are lots of receivers all over the ceiling, and they're all party line and multiplexed, then you have a control system that's pure delight. <laughs> the main things that most people are not aware of 
is first of all start a project that you can realistically finish and secondly don't feel that what you do is cast in concrete so to speak if you start a layout that you can achieve and let's face it that's generally a four feet by eight feet sheet of plywood then you can achieve something that will operate and keep it simple and as soon as it is operating well chop it up and start over again within a matter of months you'll have a layout that is operationally good enough to show your friends, your family, etc. Then your confidence begins to build and pretty soon you're building a model railroad and then you're starting to build scenery and if you stick with it long enough and actually finish one of these things then you're, you're hooked for life and not only that you'll find that it is an enormously relaxing uh, I, I would almost call it a, an obsession or an avocation or whatever because then you can, you can have a little world of your own when you come home. Primary component of bench work, of course, is wood. Wood is available in dimensional lumber. Uh, harder and harder to find is good, straight, clear lumber. When you do find it, it's expensive. This one by four piece is a little over $7, about three and a half dollars for the one by two. It also obviously is restricted to the dimensions that you get from, from lumber yards. An option is to go to using plywood, or in this case, MDF, which stands for medium density fiberboard, and to cut your own stock. A four by eight sheet of the MDF is about $20, and I can get 12 one by four pieces out of that for a significant savings in cost, but obviously an increase in labor. If you're living in an area where it's hard to cut or you don't have the tools, spending the money on the wood makes perfectly good sense. On the other hand, if you can rip it yourself, you can save yourself quite a bit of money. Um, the other disadvantage to using wood besides cost is, as I said, dimensions. Putting the one by two to make an L girder on top of here leaves a relatively small lip here for screwing up into the joists. I prefer to have a wider piece that I can cut out of the MDF. Gives me a little more room to uh, get my drill underneath and work up as we'll see when we assemble it. In order to rip plywood or MDF down to dimensional lumber, you're going to need to cut it with a saw. You can either use a table saw if you have one, or for most of us, a skill saw. Most skill saws come with a guide like this, so this one happens to be an aftermarket version. You adjust it by clamping it with the screw here. This one has a fine tooth adjustment here. You can set the dimension either using a square to measure out against the blade, or if you have a piece of stock on hand, you can simply set it against the stock. I've already got this one set. Set your saw in place, have your guide firmly. I find it works best if I keep my hand on this and help guide it. Now that we've got our wood cut, we can begin to assemble our bench work. We'll need some tools to do that. A skill saw, framing square, some clamps, wood glue, a drill driver, preferably with a combination bit, drill and screwdriver, that really speeds up the work, tape measure, a saber saw when we come to cutting roadbed, and of course screws. First thing we're going to do is build an L girder. One of the great advantages of L girder bench work is that it requires virtually no critical cutting or measuring. Um, that was one of the reasons that Lynn Westcott developed it. We're going to build an L girder, which is basically setting the roughly two inch wide piece on top of our one by four. We'll run a bead of glue, screw a series of holes to clamp it in place, and that's really all there is to it. I'm using tight bond wood glue. Any of the sort of yellow wood glues work well. So we run that the length. One of the other great advantages of L girder bench work is that you can assemble it almost completely by yourself. It doesn't mean it isn't handy to have some people around. 
but they really aren't necessary. I'm going to set the L piece on top. I want to make sure my ends are aligned. And then I'll start right here in the middle. I'm making sure that it's flush on the back side. The drill. The bit makes an automatic countersink hole. And again, one handed change. Find a screw. Okay, and we'll just work our way down, probably a screw every 16 inches, maybe as little as 24, I mean as much as 24 is all you really need. The screws are mainly there to make sure it's clamped. Okay, our next step in the L girder bench work is to build the leg units, which are really an integral part of L girder bench work. Obviously to do that you need to decide how high your layout's going to be. That's a subject of great debate. Uh, however, one simple way of approaching it is our stock comes in normally eight foot lengths. Chopping it in half makes an easy way to go. I find a four foot layout height is quite a comfortable viewing height. Um, though if you have kids and you want it accessible, you might want it lower. Um, some people prefer it even higher. These are eight foot one by uh, two by threes. Uh, which are relatively inexpensive. Uh, you need worry less about having these perfectly straight, though you don't want them corkscrewed either. I'll make my four foot mark. I've already measured them and know that they are in fact eight feet. Even when cutting something this small or narrow, it's a good idea to go ahead and mark a square cut. It makes it a lot easier when cutting with a skill saw to actually have a good square line to follow. People who say they can't get good square cuts usually haven't marked them. Okay, I'll now get my skill saw and proceed to make the cuts. I'm going to build my bench work with the legs 30 inches apart though you can in fact build L girder bench work to any dimension, as narrow as 12 inches, maybe as much as 4 feet or more. That's one of the great advantages of L girder bench work is its flexibility. In order to make these 30 inches apart, I need to get off the sawhorses and work down on the floor. So that's what I'll do next. All right, to assemble our legs, I've moved down onto the floor. I have my basic legs, my two bys. I have a cross piece. This is actually temporary for the moment. And then I'm going to be adding cross bracing. Now you can use one by material for the cross bracing. Um, I've ripped up some narrow pieces of eight, uh, 3 16 inch plywood uh, that I like to use just because it's, it's less bulky, easier to work with. The first step is to measure down from the top. In this case, I'm going to come down about eight inches. I'm not gluing this because I want this spot to be removable. So I'm going to drill one side first. Put in my screw. and then I'm going to square it up with my framing square. Now I know that it's square to this board, so that if I line it up on the 8 inch mark here, we're going to be square across. And I said I was going to build my legs 30 inches apart. So I still need to be spread out a little more over here. Again, it doesn't matter how much overhang I have on either side of this piece. It's just a temporary marker. And even the 30 inch dimension 
isn't terribly critical unless you're dealing with some particular space consideration on your layout. <clears throat> we'll add the first piece of cross bracing. Again, it's not terribly critical just where this goes. Cross bracing will ensure that it stays square. If I were working with one by material instead of this plywood, I would put one diagonal brace on this side of the legs and then flip it over and install the other one on the other side. But using the lighter material, I can put it on the same side. Screw is in. The legs will be rigid and they won't come out of square. Because that's the nature of cross bracing and why we use it. Now I'm going to take my saber saw and just trim this off to length. Main reason you want to cut it off is just to make sure you don't catch your leg on it and hurt yourself. Now that we've got this one, we'll build another one just like it and proceed to assemble the L girders onto them. I finished building my second set of legs and now we're going to put feet on them. We're going to use what are called T-nuts with a bolt that screws into them. And this allows us to level the legs because Concrete floors and basements, most of them are purposely sloped, but none of them are at dead flat in any case, and you want to be able to level your bench work so that everything sits square. Now we'll take a 3 8 inch bit and drill the holes in the end of the legs to install these. One of the reasons for using 2 by lumber for the legs is for just this reason, to give us room to put in the T-nuts. You'll want to have drilled the hole deep enough to allow the bolt to move in and out. Now we'll put the T-nut into the hole, the prongs down, and hammer it in place. Then you just all, all you have to do obviously is run in the bolt. Don't screw it in all the way. You want to run it in about halfway because that allows you to then adjust the feet up as well as down. And now we'll flip around and do the same thing on the other leg. Now that we have our legs assembled, we can begin to put on the L girders. Again, one of the advantages I like about L girder bench work is that I don't have to have a partner to help me put it together, even though it doesn't hurt to have one. All I need do is set this up here for the moment, resting it on my temporary joist, and then I clamp it in position. And again, these kind of squeeze bar clamps are very quick and handy for that kind of work. Once I've got it clamped, I'm going to put one screw in here just to secure it in place. Now that I have the screw in position, I can remove this clamp and I can angle the legs out to about 90 degrees. That'll make it easier as I pick up and put on the other set of legs. How far apart you put the legs is to some extent purely a matter of uh, convenience, though if you're building a larger layout and you know you need them in particular positions, that can affect your choice. We'll do the same thing. We'll clamp this in place and screw it. The last part of L girder bench work is to add some diagonal braces from the legs up to here. That's actually a step that we can do right now, or in some cases, you may want to wait until later in the process, but we'll show how to do it right now. I've cut some triangles 
from that same 3 16 I used for this. Um, you can use quarter inch ply, whatever ply is handy. Uh, these can be cut easily on a table saw, but they can also be cut with a skill saw. They also don't have to be triangular. There's no reason you can't use a rectangular piece of wood. What we're going to do is use this to allow us to bolt onto this piece of one by so that it's flush with this edge since this is inset. Ideally, we'll cut this at an angle, but it's not absolutely necessary since this will reach down and catch it. Same thing here, that can always be trimmed later. I'm going to attach this to this first, and for that I will use a little bit of glue. and then I'll screw it in place. For this thinner ply, we want to use shorter screws. I've been using one and a quarter or one and a half inch screws for most of the assembly. For this, a one inch screw is plenty. I put these, resting them on top of the temporary supports. I could, in fact, if I decided I wanted this at a slightly different level, have adjusted these and still could, up or down, anywhere, um, even if I have trimmed my diagonal braces across the entire length. Presumably you want them somewhere up close, though I can also trim these off out of the way. Eventually we'll be putting joists across here to which we'll attach our track risers, so the fact that these are sticking up is not really a problem. Again, this is going to come in here and set right like that. And now we'll attach, we'll screw down there and we'll be set. We'll check the square of the legs before screwing that in. The final step is adding the joists that will actually support the risers for the roadbed. These joists can also be of any length that you determine. Um, I've made these just slightly wider than my 30 inch bench work, but they can easily overhang by a foot or more on either side. One of the advantages of L girder benchwork and this style of framing is that you don't necessarily have to have a rigid square line along the front of your layout. It can curve and bend by offsetting your joists so that you can have a flowing edge. You can also attach ends onto these to support a fascia uh, once you've completed your scenery. So this is, again is a very flexible, easy to use style of benchwork. Okay, I'm going to position my first joist, clamp it in place, and then screw up from underneath. I'll do the same thing, work my way down. When I go and work on the other side, I'll make sure that these are square to my L girders. While not critical, it makes it a lot easier once I'm starting to lay roadbed to know that everything's squared up and I can measure consistent distance between each one from side to side. With the joists in place, we have rigid, flexible bench work. With our roadbed risers, we'll be able to have scenery below as well as above. The bench work is easy to use, can be assembled by one person, and is flexible no matter what your layout design. Welcome to the world of Roma Ridge and North Summit. They're working communities with all the amenities you'd expect to find. But where in the world are they? Why, in Neil Thompson's basement, of course. It comes out of my head. Uh, I use a drafting table. I make up uh, a plan. I engineer a plan for the structures, the gussets and framework and everything for a bridge. Lay a sheet of wax paper over these drawings and then start constructing right on the drafting board and then finally assemble all the parts together, uh, weather them, and make them so they look really prototypical, and then they're ready to place in the railroad. But I engineer the structure or the bridge, or whatever it may be, to fit the area it's going into, just like the real world. Neil Thompson of West Bend, Wisconsin, is known for winning best of show for his scratch-built trestles and the kit buildings that he modifies. But how does he do it? 
to win a contest, you always have to go several steps further to pick the judge's interest, so to speak. Uh, instead of just putting up a regular plastic structure, uh, you have to go into a board-by-board -board construction, probably a few nail holes, the weathering of the wood, the weathering and etching of the metal, the m building of a window. If you just place a window in a building and not have it open or closing, this, this is just mundane. You have to make it workable, doors open, uh, have people, have excitement, and get it to its era where it's supposed to be coming from. To capture that realism means taking extra step, as in this impressive roundhouse. And Neil is kind enough to share a few of his techniques. Model making really isn't all that serious. It's sometimes quite simple. The, the materials you use aren't really that exotic. This is just like a modified refined uh, white glue. And to make a window, we just go around a periphery of a frame, a window frame, just draw the material across the frame. And sooner or later, by capillary action, kind of fills in. And voila, we have our completed window. Now it will dry to a clear substance like this. Get the shiny effect of window panes. You can also apply a little paint on the back side to show industrial window, windows that have been broken out and replaced with opalescent glass. And how does he put the years on his buildings? When we're etching metal to get a nice patina of aging and rusting of metal or tin roofs or metal siding, you have to be extremely careful. This is etched in an, an acid and we just drop it into our acid, swish it a little bit, then we will remove it from the acid bath and the chemical process starts. After a little sizzling and bubbling, then we put it right into water to stop the action of the acid bath and then lay it on paper to leave uh, a little rusting action will come and a patina will occur like you see on this piece of siding here. And of course this is applied to our, our buildings, wherever we may need it on our structures, for roofs or siding or what have you. Two trains and 10 miles of main line surround the towns of Roma Ridge and North Summit. But don't think this community is landlocked. My inspiration for this ferry scene and the wharf area, I guess I wanted to expand the railroad to have an interchange so I could get to the outside world and the outside world could get to me. So I could interchange cars through that ferry boat and interchange with other club members, other railroad buffs, where we can interchange cars and have a connecting railroad. So the railroad just doesn't stop here at the basement, it goes on f forever. Neil's attention to detail does go on forever, and that's certainly seen in his honors and his sense of humor. Okay, if you really want to hone your skills in model building, you have to enter a few contests. And also, you hope that the guy that's better than you are in model building doesn't show up at that event. Neil Thompson's layout is a labor of love for him. But as Roma Ridge and North Summit continue to expand, available basement space is shrinking. There are some neighbors that are interested in model railing. We can tunnel right through the basement and have an interconnecting line. Or we could uh, put a helix up right up to the first or second floor and, and incorporate another room. But uh, this will keep on our hats for now. <laughs> Today we're going to look at scratch building a structure, and you may ask why would I want to scratch build? Mainly because it's often the only way to get the building you really want. Moreover, it's also just plain fun. It's enjoyable to build something and be able to say that it's completely your own. There are plans available for buildings and cars and locomotives uh, published in all the magazines such as Model Railroader. The one I'm going to do today is the Colorado and Southern's Leadville station, and the plans were printed in HO scale. I'm going to build the model in O scale. I'm going to work primarily from the HO plans, but I did take my computer scanner, though you can also do it on a photocopy machine, and blow it up to O scale as well to give myself a sense of the final proportions. Whenever you're working from plans, you want to make sure that the photocopy you have or the magazine itself is in fact accurate. So you'll need a scale rule. This is a multiple scale rule. It has O scale on one side, HO on the other. And 
When you're building a model, you want to take all your dimensions for what you're actually going to produce. We're going to build this wall. There are some important architectural details here. The brick wall isn't solid. It's divided just below the windows with this course of stonework. There are also, as we mentioned already, the arches above the windows, which also have little stone cornices at each end. So our wall is really going to be broken into two brick segments separated by this course of stone, and then we're going to have to trim the openings. We want to be careful that we don't just make the wall this tall, because of course this is an angled roof. So luckily for us, the plan makers have given us a cutaway view that shows us the full height of the wall here. So we'll measure that in HO with our HO scale, since that's what this plan is, and I'm at 10 inches, 15 feet, 10 inches. That dimension only takes me down to the platform. This set of plan happens to also show a cutaway view that shows the foundation below the level of the wood platform. So I really want to come down and add that dimension as well. So we're going to go up to 17 feet, 10 inches, knowing that this is the platform level. And I'm going to just go ahead and rough in my wall. I know I'm going to have this seam just below the windows. I'm obviously not trying to draw a scale plan here in any sense of the word. I'm just giving myself a place to mark some dimensions. Now the overall width is given to us on the plans. It's 24 feet, 0 inches. I'm going to be banking a wall, and I need to decide, is the end wall going to sit against the side walls or inside of it? Because that's going to determine part of that dimension for me. I plan on putting this end wall on the outside. I still can't go the full 24 feet because this styrene subwall is going to have the brick on the outside. And this brick is 020, 20 thousandths of an inch, which is, happens to be an, eight, an O scale inch. So I can, I'm going to come back two inches and make it 23 feet, 10 inches. And so my prototype windows were exactly seven feet, three inches tall. My O scale windows that I've purchased are seven feet, six inches tall. So they're going to be just a little taller than, than, the, than the model. When you're building a model, you want to take all your dimensions as we transfer it to stock from one direction. Uh, we're going to measure everything from the bottom up. Uh, as a safe way to make sure we know where we're going. So again, coming up from my baseline, and I see that my windows are set two feet six inches up. So from my base, that'll be four feet six inches to the bottom of the windows. The rock face itself is 10 inches. I've got my width, I've got the bottom of my windows, I know how tall my windows are, now I need to space out my windows. So I come over from the side, and I find each side is three feet, two inches, I come in from the side. And this side, the drawing shows three feet, three inches. It's not surprising to get a little bit of variation uh, in anything, just as they're drawing. There's probably going to be a little variation when you actually cut it. We'll go with three feet three. Um, again, we're going to lose that inch on each side because of the final sheathing outside. So we're back down to that three feet two inches as this dimension. And again, my window dimension of my O scale windows is three feet four inches, and that should do us just fine. And we'll measure from the edge of the building to the next window, 10 feet three inches. And again, we're getting a little dimensional difference. I'm getting more like 10 feet four on that side, so we've, we've shifted over a little. We'll go 10 feet three, again, we'll lose that inch. But here, when I actually come to transferring it to stock, 
before I cut this dimension, I'm going to make sure that my width in here is actually accurate for my window rather than simply accurate to the plans. We have our dimensions. We know where we're going. We're now going to build the model in O scale. Again, since I measured it all out in HO measurements, in prototype feet and inches, it's easy enough to trim here. So again, I set my 17 foot mark for my 17 foot 10 inch height. And I come up here and there's three, six, nine, and there's my 10 inch mark. I can move to the far side of the sheet, mark the same thing, 17 feet, 10 inches. And I'll be able to scribe right across it. Hold your knife vertically and take a firm but not overly hard scribe. And then you just break. And now we have a wall height section. We'll now go for our 23 foot 10 inch width. In this case, I'll work from this edge, so I'll set it to the 10 inch mark and come over here to the 23 foot mark and measure it off. It's important that you get your wall sections nice and square. And now we have our wall section. It's good to mark everything as you build it. We're now going to measure up the four feet, six inches to the bottom of our windows. So again, I set it at the four foot mark and I mark my six inches. I'm going to just draw this line for right now because I want to go ahead and mark the top of the windows as well, which are going to be four feet six plus seven feet six, a total of 11 feet, 12 feet. It's always a good idea at that point to grab one of your windows and make sure that you haven't made any mistakes. It looks like we're gonna fit in there just fine. You wanna keep your rule square to the edge, even a little bit of angle can change your dimensions. And now we'll come in from the sides three feet, two inches. And I'm going to use my square here to draw up that line. Three feet two. The width of my window was three feet four inches. And then our center window, we measured over 10 feet three. We wanted our windows to be three feet four inches wide. And we're right on, so that's great news. I put X's for the parts I'm gonna get rid of. Top, south bottom, S1, S2, S3, and S4. And as I cut these apart, if I get the parts mixed up, I'll know where I'm, know what parts I need to go where. Okay, I now have my parts for my wall, and I can begin to reassemble it. I'm going to use my MEK, and I have a small brush. With the scribe and snap method, the plastic lines up just perfectly. And so all you have to do is touch, blow a little bit of plastic in, and you're set. So there's our, our south-facing elevation wall without the brick. 
our next step will be to take the brick sheet and add it and we'll follow a very similar process. For the brick dimension, I want to work with my bricks. This part of the building is of course going to be hidden up under the eaves, so if I don't line up perfectly with the top with the bricks, it's not a big deal. So I do want my bricks, however, to end right on this line because that's where the stonework starts and that's the very bottom of the windows. So I come down here and I look to see if I go up one more, I'm actually overlapping a little, so I'll leave a little gap at the top of the bricks. I'm going to mark the line right there. I don't need to mark any more because I'm just going to follow the trench of the bricks. I'm going to cut the whole length of this because all my walls are this height, so I might as well get it all taken care of at once. With this, the embossed stock doesn't scribe and snap quite as well as plain sheet. Okay, I've got my sheet. I'm lined up. I can line it up next to here. And again, I'm lining up the bottom of the brick with the bottom of the windows. And now I'm going to scribe or mark with my pencil my window openings. And I can simply come down here. Cut out the top. And we have our upper brick. So this lines up just fine. For this, I'm going to use the, the liquid cement just because it's slower setting. I can go ahead and, and, and mark that in. But before I glue it, I need to work for my arches. The little arches come down two brick courses below the top of the window. Again, we have the arched window stock we're going to use, a brick stock. Cutting out along a curve, I have to freehand. For this, I find keeping the blade tilted away from my curve allows me to trace along the bricks. These arches go from window corner to window corner, so I'll make three of these, and again, they're going to sit just like that. I'm going to use my cutout of the arch here as a guide for marking the arc from one corner to the other. And that's what we need to cut out. So I'll do all three like that and then we'll glue them onto here and glue the arc in place. Okay, for the stonework itself, as I said, I'm going to use, this is a product, um, acrylic modeling paste. Uh, this is a generic brand from a local art store. Uh, Liquitex makes the same thing. It's a paste-like product, about the same consistency as drywall mud. To apply it, I'm just going to use, this is just some cheap plastic uh, clay tools I got at the, the art store. Uh, you could use almost anything, even the tip of the brush that I just used. This one has a bit of a sort of little spoon shape that I found useful. It's a bit of a messy process, kind of globbing it in there. And we're going to try to work it in gently. So once those are done with this first coat, I can set it aside. We'll come back and we can add a final coat. We'll actually let it set up a little bit and do some surface texturing on it once it's set for just a little bit. All right, the next piece we're going to build is going to be the dormer that sits above the ticket bay window. So we're going to start by building this, this piece of the dormer with all the fancy trim work. I've already made my measurements, and in order to establish the angle of this piece, we're going to take the width from this point, the center line here of the what would then be a right triangle, and measure this distance, 8 feet 3 inches to that point. So this dimension is eight feet, three inches, centered 
on that 16 foot 4 inch width. I have a piece of scribed stock here, so I'm going to measure over from one edge 8 feet 2 inches to get to my center line. And I note when I do that, I come just shy of one of my scribes. So in this case, I'm going to take a simpler way out. I'm going to go ahead and just measure from here, from an actual scribe, over 8 feet 2 inches. And I'll make it in two halves rather than try to trim right next to a center line like that. I'll just use this as my center point. Since I'm going to be cutting at an angle, I can just gently file both sides and I'll come down to the dimension I need. So now I'm going to come down 8 feet 3 inches along that vertical. So this will be my base. And now we'll cut out our base. Now we're going to need to notch this for this section there. And according to my drawings, I needed to come up two feet six inches, and I'm coming in three feet four from either side. I need to be careful after scribing this I'm trying to do the break to make sure I get the break along my line and not where the scribings are, and that one worked just fine. So here I put a little more pressure on that one than I perhaps would on most scribe and snaps. To make sure I've got a good clean edge, and I want to grab it close and get my break. Now that we have our base, we're going to be able to add our strip wood detailing. In order to determine those dimensions, we have to look closely at the plan because we can see that they've we have these little beveled edges. These appear to be one by sixes. I'm measuring on these not only from here to here, but I actually want to come all the way up to the surface of my roof, and that appears to be at least a one by eight. So I'm going to use one by eight material here and one by six for all the rest. I'm going to lay my one by eights in first and then start to work around uh, the others. Here's my one by eights. And I'm going to lay them directly on my model because I'm now going to build to my base unit rather than to the plans themselves. Mark there and mark the edge here. I want to err, if anything, on being slightly longer. I can file back. This is close to a 90 degree angle, almost exactly. We appear to be right on which means this will be a 45 degree cut and I can use my little cutter here to make the miters. Now line it up there, get my fingers out of the way. All right, so this piece should fit now right in. I'm going to tack it just at one end and with that we have the front piece of our dormer almost complete except for these decorative little fan pieces. Those may look absolutely impossible, but I actually found that they weren't that hard to do and we'll do those next. All they really are is a series of little triangles. Once they were all put together on my pattern I did for the little ones, they actually work quite well. So I peeled off that and then I got a second one for free. And I need to trim the end to match the angle. It can actually be handled pretty well. Okay, so now that we've finished this area, we'll make one more of the fans on this side. And then all we'll have to do is add in the shingle material and the windows. And again, the shingle material that I'm using from Grantline and the little HO windows will follow the same techniques we've seen for cutting out the wall sections. So rather than spend time showing that to you, we're now going to move on and lay out some roof sections, which can be a little tricky, particularly on a hip roofed building like this, where we don't have a, a vertical face and square corners to work with. What's important to remember is that on the plans, we can measure these horizontal dimensions and they're accurate. But this line can't be measured in this view. 
we have to take the measurement from by developing it from from the length from here to here which is this dimension so first we're going to do is measure the overall width of our roof from here to here of this corner so I'm going to have a dimension along here of 50 feet 6 inches then my distance from here to here is actually this length so that's what I have to measure now and it is 23 feet 3 inches so that's my vertical dimension 23 feet 3 inches and I'm just going to make a square mark it doesn't really matter where on here I make that and come up 23 feet 3 inches if I go back to this drawing now I'm going to have to find out this length which is going to be centered down below so we have 13 feet 2 inches subtracted from my 50 feet 6 inches and again the 13 feet 2 will divide in half as well so 13 feet is going to be 6 feet 6 inches plus half of the 2 is 1 inch so 6 feet 7 inches to either side of my center line but that's a finished roof section and you can see that when we line it up we'll get the shape we're looking for um, well last thing I showed you on building was cutting out a roof section we cut out this one here I then did the end of the roofs and I used the same method and then I simply found the center line of my width and drew my triangle all of these assembled very well I added these gussets so these sit right on top of the walls I was very pleased with how all the roofs fit um, and in fact adding on the baggage section fit very closely but not quite I still got a little bit of a gap along this edge so I took thin this is 0 0.010 styrene and made myself a couple of spice plates in fact very much like you would on a real roof at a joint um, if I was doing it even if it fit perfectly before putting on the shingles I would take just a piece of, of regular printer paper typewriter paper um, and cut it and put it in the seam anyway just as I would just as you would on a real roof with flashing between so this works just fine and I'll glue along there uh, to give me my addition this has been a pretty complex structure probably not the one you would choose to start with for your first scratch building project but I went ahead and showed it because in fact each of the steps is no different than what you would do for a simpler building when I'm done I'll have a unique building that no one else has on their layout uh, it's not significantly more difficult than assembling a kit building except that it takes more thought uh, but that thinking figuring out how to do things is part of the fun so take a stab at scratch building and enjoy yourself This is the Mitchell Park Conservatory in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. These three domes have been a 30-year landmark in Milwaukee and house three botanical gardens. One dome shows an arid climate, while a second exhibits a tropical climate. But the third dome has an ever-changing show. In this case, a show featuring garden railroading. Conservatory director Richard Risch tells us what prompted this display. The inception of this goes back to 1992 when Ameriflor, a big international flower show, was in Columbus, Ohio, and we saw an exhibit there, uh, right outside, uh, done by the German government. And they had these wonderful trains running through the hills and running over the bridges and through the buildings, and we thought, what a wonderful idea this may be. And then a couple of years later, uh, the Madison Botanical Gardens had a small exhibit, and their attendance shot up like 60%. We thought, gee, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do here? The planning for such a show involves people with a multitude of different talents. Jim Sia is the principal landscape architect for the conservatory. The Mitchell Park Conservatory staff uh, gets together with the park planning staff, which I'm a member of, and we talk about the theme of the show and talk about ideas and concepts in order to execute a show. 
this show, the train show, really started back probably about three, three and a half months ago when all staff members from park maintenance, uh, park planning staff, the conservatory staff, uh, the artists, um, the, and, and we really sat down and kind of generated and, and brainstormed about ideas on which we could use the dome in executing and interpreting what a garden train show should be. It's a fascinating process because it takes carpenters, it takes plumbers, it takes electricians, it takes artists, it takes horticulturists, uh, it takes the greenhouse center to raise the plants and coordinate the plants, uh, and it takes our forestry department to put in large plant material. So it's, it's really a varied uh, responsibility, a lot of coordination has to go on, and the planning starts initially from uh, a meeting and then it goes to the blueprints uh, which gives everybody an idea of how we want to execute the show and ultimately we put a schedule to get all those points of the show and all the details of the show uh, framed and open and ready for uh, the, the grand show as we call it. Our first stop is the woodworking shop to discuss the bridge detail. Hi Tim. Um, Hi Jim. How's it going this morning on the trust detail? I know you had some questions about how we were going to execute it, so why don't you show me what uh, you were it's, thinking? It's going good. I, I think I came up with a, a good way to do it. Um, at first, I thought we could bend the logs in a curve, but it turned out that the, the logs bent at, at too much of a point. So what I decided would be best to do is to, to cut each individual piece of log so that they fit together, and then the uprights, I would uh, drill the appropriate size hole so that it fits in, and it'll give you the rough forest service bridge look that you're looking for. The buildings make up another aspect of the show. Lynn Burke is the artist in charge of delivering this part of the scenery. We're part of uh, the horticulture region of parks, and we do the designing um, of the vignettes uh, as they come, the ideas and the plans come from um, the landscape architect, Jim. Some of the buildings behind me were donated or are lent by um, the gentleman that's lending all the train material. And those are either came in kits or in um, the ready to use state. And so we put the kits together. Um, we're doing another um, little building over on the other side of the room, a uh, little log cabin that my uh, co-worker Ted Condi is working on and that's turning out real cute. So there's just a whole variation uh, depending on the little area how we decide to work on the building. Live plant material is the mainstay of the show, but you must plan in advance for all the foliage. The Milwaukee County Greenhouse is notified by the horticulturists at the, at the conservatory about three months to a year before the show. This, this, this enables us to grow plants for what they require for the shows. We choose azaleas for the show because it is a plant that's it's, um, kind of um, related with the fall and the, win the winter season. It blooms very well and it puts on a really, really good floral show for people. Why would the conservatory put together a train show? Garden railroading is becoming popular in the United States due to the fact it's a bigger train. It's easier to work with, it's easier to handle. It's something you don't have to have a permanent setup to use. You can take it up, you can put it down. You know, if you don't have a lot of space in your basement, it's something you can set up outside. Well, the Domes uh, promotes a perfect setting for trains as far as its, its layout, uh, the decor, as far as foliage, uh, plants. Everything looks so uh, innovative and original. It's uh, something you normally wouldn't see uh, except maybe on some other camera or, or uh, viewing. But this is a perfect climate, a, a, a very perfect setting for uh, a large G-scale train to be seen. But it's the children who like to see the trains most of all. I like trains because I think they're interesting and they're fun. Sometimes my dad lets me dri drive his garden railroad train sometimes too. Why do you like trains? Because my mother told me we were going to California on one. We love that. We love that. 
Well, I really think it's great. Uh, they've got a lot of room and a really nice layout. A lot of trains and model boats to see. I like trains. The Southern Pacific 4449 is certainly one of the most famous steam locomotives ever constructed. It's earned every bit of that fame. It combines an unparalleled combination of steam power, beauty, and nostalgia. It was built by the Lima, Ohio Locomotive Works in the 1940s to pull the Southern Pacific's popular daylight passenger trains along the West Coast. It was the newest and most beautiful train the West had ever seen. And it was larger than life. An engine and tender nearly 100 feet long. Loaded with fuel and water, the locomotive alone weighed in at more than 840,000 pounds. The 4449 was in service for 15 years until the growing popularity of diesel forced her into retirement in the mid-1950s. Given to the city of Portland, she sat until the 1970s when train lovers had the brilliant idea of making this locomotive the one to pull America's bicentennial freedom train across the country. The man selected to get the retired train back into working order for the bicentennial run back in 1976 was Doyle McCormick, a man who has made railroading both his vocation and his avocation. He supervised the restoration and rebuild and then rode with the freedom train every inch of the way. And that train was a 26-car train that toured the, the whole continental United States during the 1975-76 bicentennial celebration that took pieces of American history to the American people. And during its tour, uh, I can't exactly remember the numbers, there were like three or four million people that went through the train and there were 15 or 20 million people that saw the train. Uh, there were places, Chicago in particular, um, it was to talk about it today, people wouldn't believe, but there were so many people down at trackside to see that train go by that it was like a ship parting the ocean. And the slower you went, the longer they stood on the track. I mean, you're just piloting this thing through an ocean of people. There were thousands upon thousands of people. You wouldn't believe it today, but the reaction was that, you know, there's a lot of patriotism in America, and they all came down to see the Freedom Train. Afterwards, she was returned to Portland and restored to her original red, orange, and black paint scheme. Today, she carries the black and silver colors of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Doyle McCormick is in the cab during the occasional excursion. At most other times, a nostalgic McCormick pursues his other love. What you're looking at here is the remains of probably one of the classiest diesel locomotives ever built. This is an Alco PA, or like I say, the remains thereof. And my intention is to make this look as good as the day it come out of the factory eventually. Put my heart and soul into it, and most of my bank account too. The PAs hold a special place in my, my heart, if you want to call it that. Like I said, my dad worked for the nickel plate and got me hooked on trains at an early age. In 1955, he made a trip to New York City and took me with him, and we went down to the depot to get on the train and he took me up and we rode the engine of nickel plate number eight from Conneaut to Buffalo, which is 116 miles. The engine on that train was nickel plate PA number 190. That was the first diesel locomotive I ever rode. And from that point on, that became a special engine in my, you know, my passion. And I've always wanted to own, even as a, you know, a teenager with these wild fantasies, I wanted to own a PA. And it's been a quest I've been on since, you know, I was 14 years old. And it, took, it only took me 40 years to do it, is all. If you look at the lines of these and the architecture and the design, they just say speed. You know, the curves. You don't see curves in, in industrial equipment today. Everything's box square corners. These have the nice lines, the curves. They're sleek. They got the long wheelbase trucks under them. They just look like something that wants to get out and run at 100 miles an hour. They have a face on them that only a mother could love, I guess. But. Uh, to a lot of the rail fans, these are the epitome of the diesel locomotive. Well, I can remember, you know, as, as a boy, my first ride was in a cab just like this. First diesel locomotive ever rode. Sat in the middle seat there most of the ways, and then the engineer, I was only, what, 12 years old, he brought me over and sat me in his lap, 
let me blow the horn, of course. You know, that's pretty exciting for a 12-year-old. And then over the years, I rode uh, on the PAs on the nickel plate you know, dozens of times as I rode back and forth. I was in the Navy at Great Lakes. And my dad would take me on trips. Just formed a real connection with these engines. And when I stand here and I remember those days, I can see them coming back. I'll be 60-some years old when I do it again, but it'll be worth the trip. There are those of us who love the history of trains. It's people like Doyle McCormick we can thank for keeping that history alive. Now, in order to have a smooth running railroad, we need to make sure that all the rolling stock on the layout matches the NMRA standards. Now, the NMRA standards are a set of very basic dimensions that have been developed over about 80 years by the National Model Railroad Association. These standards have been published as printed booklets and they're also available on the internet as PDF files you can download with your own computer. I have a whole set of the data sheets for and standards for the uh, different scales here and we have sheet metal gauges available for N, H, O, and O scale, as well as a number of other gauges that are used to check these dimensions. And before we can put any car on the layout, we need to do some checking to make sure it will work. So the gauge has little notches in the edges of it, and they should fit on the wheel set. If they don't fit over the flanges properly, you know the wheel set is either narrow or wide, depending on how it fits the gauge. And we need to check all four wheels on the car, because each axle could be different than the other ones. Okay, after we get the initial check of the wheels done, we'll set this one aside for now. And the next thing we need to check is coupler height. And KDE makes a very nice little gauge which will fit on the track or you can make your own little uh, test fixture by using a couple of re-railers and two of the KDE height gauges. Because all I have to do is set the car on the on re-railer and I can push it down to the end so I can check if they're going to couple at the right height. And I can tell immediately whether I need to add some washers to raise the coupler height a little bit or take some material off of the top of the truck to lower it. And then by uncoupling one end, we can push it to the other end and do a very quick visual check there to make sure that it's the right height at both ends of the car. For a coupler height, we're dealing both with the height of the coupler in relation to the standard height and also how high the trip pin underneath is. The trip pin should just barely clear the little uh, bottom shelf on the gauge. So we can take a close look at that and in this case it's quite a bit higher. So we use a special pair of pliers to turn the car over and we can squeeze the little actuating wire to bring it down and shape it so that it'll fit onto the gauge. Okay, now we're a little bit too deep so we'll use the pliers in the other direction to bend the end up just a little bit. And the idea is we want to just clear the gauge like it is there. And then we have to do the same thing on the other end. And as we check both ends of the car, that's done because sometimes a car is perfect on one end and the other end may be high or low. More often than not, I find they're low and if that's the case, you can get very small washers 
that are either 10 or 15 thousandths of an inch thick to put on the kingpin of the truck to raise the car up or we may have to file a little material off the top of the truck in order to lower the end a little bit. The reason the coupler height is important is we want the couplers to match evenly so when we're pulling a load on the cars they stay coupled. If we have couplers that are mismatched in height then you'll find that they'll slide out of each other when you get a heavy load on them. Okay, the next thing we'll take up is how to adjust the gauge of the wheel sets. Now most of the wheels come as a plastic wheel set mounted on a brass axle. And the trick here is we need to adjust the width of the wheel set until it exactly matches the gauge. Now this, this one is just a little tight. So on this type of wheel set, it's very easy to just hold the axle with a pair of pliers and just use your fingers to twist the wheel set in or out on the axle. And you just work it back and forth until it matches the gauge exactly. But the one thing you have to be careful of is you do these adjustments, you still want to keep the wheels centered on the axle. Otherwise, you're going to have a truck that runs down the track at an angle, and that'll have a tendency to derail. Now, another way of taking care of problems like this is to take the original wheel sets out of the truck and we want to clean the journals out so that they're nice and smooth. And there's a special little tool that's a reamer. One end has a sharp edge on it. The other end is just a cone like the end of an axle. So what we'll do is slip this into the truck like this. And by squeezing just a little bit, we can use the little rubber collar to rotate it and it'll polish the inside of the bearing. And we can take this out, reverse the little reaming tool, put it in in the other direction, and we can cut the other opposite side. It only takes a couple of turns to smooth everything out. And then the last step is to add a, one of the better quality wheel sets. And those are usually made out of all metal, and they have very sharp points on them. And they can go into the truck just by bending the side frame a little bit until they snap in. Once we have the new wheel sets in the truck, you'll find that these things are very free rolling now because we have a metal bearing against the Delrin plastic, which is very slick. And you'll find that once you have a bunch of your cars to this free rolling state, your layout may not be as level as you think it is. Because the cars will just roll downhill and it doesn't take much to get them moving. The last step of the process of checking a car before I put it on the layout is to check its weight. And the NMRA has a recommended practice for each scale. For HO, the car should weigh one ounce plus a half ounce per inch to come out at a standard weight that performs well on the layout. To speed things up, instead of having to calculate it all the time, I measured along the edge of my coupler height gauge here and marked in black what each car should weigh when it's coupled to this. So by putting this box car on the track, coupling it to the gauge, I can look down here and read that this one should weigh four ounces if it meets the recommended standard. So we take the car and just use a regular postal scale put it on there and it weighs two and a half ounces. So somewhere I need to come up with another ounce and a half of weight, which I'm going to want to put inside the car where it's out of sight. To make things easier, 
we can get weights that have a sticky back on them and they're all a quarter ounce each. So we just take six of these, I'd split them into two groups of three and put them on the floor at each end of the car. So then the total weight of the car will be four ounces. So it should be ready to run in any length train I have. The reason we want the cars to be a standard weight is it keeps the ones on the head end of the train from tipping over on a sharp curve. Otherwise, heavy cars at the back end are gonna tend to pull the front ones over. If they all have the same formula, then they stay on the track better and you'll get better performance with your layout. The trick though is to be hard-nosed about this inspection process and make sure that the wheels are engaged, the coupler height is correct, and the weight is correct, and then you'll get top performance from your layout. All model train layouts reflect the unique personalities of their creators. Elliot Klein's Paradise Desert and Western layout is no exception. Take a look. There are four lines on the layout because I wanted a lot of action. I enjoy running trains. I'm a collector, but I'm also an operator. And the more track and the more trains running, the more interesting the layout is to me. And there's certainly plenty of action here. You can watch trains run for about 20 minutes before you see one repeat its path. There are 20 bridges, so it's not uncommon to see a Union Pacific Northern going over one bridge, while the Santa Fe Super Chief crosses over a Dash 8 diesel on another. This setup could make a train watcher out of anyone. One minute, the Santa Fe Super Chief is soaring past Native American ruins, while the next minute, a steam shay is hauling ore cars up to the Cohiba Mine. It's easy to get mesmerized by this 1,400 square foot layout. Elliott captured the rich diversity of Arizona in his O-Gage High Rail Model Layout. It's a miniature rail tour of some of the state's most scenic areas, combining both modern diesel cars and steam locomotives with freight and passenger lines. The layout really resembles the three basic geographic areas found in Arizona. The middle level is high desert, and with the red rocks, very similar to the geography that you'd find in Sedona. Then the lower level is reminiscent of the Sonoran Desert of the Phoenix Metropolitan and Tucson Metropolitan areas. And of course, the focus of the layout is the mining site. And that mining site is very typical of mining sites that you find throughout Arizona, as well as New Mexico. And this part of the United States is rich with mining history. So that's really a focal point of the layout. Perhaps Elliot's background in broadcasting had an impact on the rich detail in his layout. A friend helped him come up with the track plan, and he hired a professional who built models for the motion picture business to create the realistic scenery and buildings. All of the buildings on the layout have been scratch built. None of them are done from kits. So the passenger station is very typical of what was done in the Southwest with regard to the architecture, the adobe architecture that you find in New Mexico and Arizona. It took seven months to complete the scenery. When it came to lighting, Elliott's television production experience came in handy again. The lighting was really important because shadows, I think, can do a lot as far as making things stand out or making things blend in. I believe that the lighting is as important as the scenery itself. There are several non-traditional engineering features in the layout. Most traditional toy train layouts or model train layouts run their track power through the control panel to control the different rail blocks on the layout. I chose not to do that and thereby eliminated half of the bus wiring that was necessary when you run the track power back to the control panel. We used DC relays and we also used bicolored LED indicators to indicate the switch positions uh, on the layout, red being a switch to a siding and green being a switch to a main line. And the control panel is basically all DC control voltages. There's no track power that runs to that control panel. So that's what ma really makes it very unique and it cut the amount of wiring by 50%. Recently, 
Elliot added a wireless handheld transmitter that enables him to walk around freely while operating the layout. And that addition led to another idea. Future plans for the layout include adding several video cameras, probably four or five, and uh, being able to look at the layout as somebody four inches tall would look at the layout. I'd also like to put some mobile cameras in the trains so that you have a panoramic view in scale as if you were riding in the cab of a locomotive or sitting in a dining car of a passenger train. Even if Elliot never changed another thing on this layout, he still achieved his major goals. The Paradise Desert and Western layout is an action-packed ride into the scenic wonders of the Southwest. Filled with technological and artistic wizardry, the layout offers challenges for anyone who simply loves to run trains or just loves to watch them run. One thing that's brought a lot of excitement to the model railroading hobby over the last few years has been the widespread availability of digital sound. That's especially true for fans of steam locomotives. Whether you're buying your locomotive with the sound installed at the factory or installing your own system, either way, sound adds a new dimension to your layout. In fact, many model railroaders are thinking of backdating their layouts to the steam era to take advantage of all the new steam locomotives with sound. I know that's what I did. Today we'll take a look at some things that you can do to make sure that the sound you get from your steam locomotives is as good as it can be so that you can enjoy your trains. One thing that helps give better sound is if the enclosure that the speaker in is rigid. The sound waves will reverberate inside there as they make their way out. They don't spend their energy forcing the tender shell to move. Another factor that can really help is making sure that all the components in your locomotive are mounted firmly inside the tender or the locomotive. You don't want anything that can rattle around. Again, the rattling of the circuit board of the speaker itself can really ruin the sound. This Trix Mikado, you'll notice, has the decoder mounted using a foam tape, keeps things nice and quiet, on top of a circuit board that is screwed tightly to the frame of the locomotive. Now I'll put it back together and we'll take a listen. Did you notice how nice and clear the chuffing and the bell sounded? That's because nothing was reverberating or vibrating in the locomotive. Another thing that can really make a difference in the sound is the size of the speakers that you use. Generally speaking, the larger the speaker you'll get, the deeper, the more full a sound you will get. It's a little bit richer, has a little more bass to it. Let's take another listen to the Mikado, which is a very, very good sounding HO scale locomotive. Then we'll take a listen to an O scale locomotive and hear the difference. Now let's listen to this big O-gauge locomotive and you'll hear the difference. That O-scale locomotive really sounded great, but having your locomotives that loud all the time, especially if you have more than one on your layout, might start to drive you a little crazy after a while, and the next thing you know, you're upstairs watching the football game. On my layout, I like to turn them down a little bit. You get a little bit clearer sound, and you also don't find yourself thinking that you're right on top of the locomotive, when in fact, in scale, it's supposed to be a half mile away. If you're thinking of installing your own sound decoders, check to see whether there's a kit available for your specific locomotive before you start. I bought this 080 switcher for my layout, but it didn't come with sound. I wanted to make sure that it had sound like my other steam locomotives, and when I checked, I found that Soundtracks had a kit available for this specific locomotive. That way, the kit has a circuit board 
that fits into the tender chassis very precisely, and it comes with a speaker and speaker enclosure that fits right up into the coal bunker. It's practically a drop-in fit. If you're installing a decoder and a speaker in a locomotive where there's not a kit available, it helps to use a small enclosure on the speaker. That will give you better sound. When I installed the speaker and decoder in this HO scale Niagara, I couldn't find a good place for the speaker along the frame of the tender. I had to put the speaker up into the coal pile, but there wasn't a ready-made way to enclose it there. What I did instead was to use a small speaker enclosure here that came from the same manufacturer as the speaker, in this case Soundtracks, and that gives it a better sound than if I had just stuck the speaker up to the top of the tender shell. Another thing that really helps give you good sound is if the flow of electricity to your locomotive is uninterrupted. The more pickups you have on the train, the better it can pick up the electricity from the rails, the better off you are. Look at these two tenders. The tender on your right does not have pickups on the axles, so it doesn't contribute to picking up electricity for the locomotive. The tender on the left does, and so a locomotive with pickups on the tender is less likely to lose contact going over a switch, less likely to have any interruptions to the sound. One thing I like to do when I install a decoder and speaker is to put a miniature plug and socket set in the wires in between the circuit board and the speaker. That makes it a lot easier for me to take it apart if I want to, say, add some weathering to the tender, change the decals, something like that. On this Niagara's tender, you'll see that there's a small plug and socket right here. If you just pull it apart, then you can take the shell right away. If you're doing your own installation, one thing you really want to check is what impedance the speakers that go with your decoder are supposed to be. They come in different impedances, basically different, different amounts of resistance to the flow of electricity. If you get a mismatch, you won't get the best sound. The speaker on the right here is an 8 ohm speaker. That's pretty typical. The speaker on the left is a 100 ohm speaker. It's used with some specialized decoders and a lot of decoders that come from Europe. As you can imagine, if you put an 8 ohm speaker in place of a 100 ohm speaker or the opposite, you won't get the best sound. Sound can really add an exciting new dimension to your layout. Give it a try. I think you'll like it. The club layout, uh, the physical plant of the layout is 72 by 70 feet, surrounded by an 8 foot aisle. And we're located in an industrial building in uh, Los Angeles. We renovated the, the whole building and made the layout that you see here today. We have 1,700 feet of main line and uh, probably 30,000 feet of rail. That's not counting sidings and all of the yards and so forth. The average time for a passenger train is very close to an hour. P uh, freight trains would take longer. Usually the easiest way to go is from A to Z. That's the way the layout's laid out. And uh, A is Alhambra which is the largest yard in the whole layout. And then it would move through the four track main line through Bend into Colton, which is our uh, industrial area. And we have all kinds of meat packing plant, oil industries. And then we move on to uh, Delta and into Echo, which the trolley line terminates at that point. And then it keeps on going in through um, what we call a valley district to Midway which is the median point of our railroad, and it's also where helpers are applied to, to trains that are too heavy to, to make the 2% grade up the mountain district. The train then leaves Midway and heads up a uh, fairly stiff grade uh, into Powderhorn, and the helpers are then removed from that at that point. Just a note about Powderhorn, it's a, a resort area. <clears throat> it started out as a railroad town, but the like the UP made Sun Valley into a resort area to draw traffic, the same thing happens here. So, uh, but then we continue on into the next station would be Red Cliff, which is the highest point on the railroad. Uh, Troy is a, a major yard along the line. It uh, provides the area with cement. It's the place where uh, lumber is collected from the mill at the, from the logging area. And then we go on, uh, down into uh, Vista, which is uh, the place where the coal uh, cars are marshaled into mainline trains. Uh, we, we come on into Whiskey and then into Zion, which is the port of our railroad, the westernmost point of the railroad. 
This actually is a point-to-point -point railroad. We, we do not go around again. There's two dispatcher panels. One controls the traffic on the east side of the railroad. The other controls traffic on the west side of the railroad. Each cab handles a train over the entire railroad. He, can, he controls not only the speed of the train, but the turnouts that, that the train passes over. His <clears throat> blocks are given to him verbally by dispatcher, and he turns them on physically. The club definitely has equipment standards, which we uh, rely on heavily for keeping everything on the rails and, and having our operation run smoothly here. Uh, basically, it's NMRA standards, and we just hold very strictly to those. The weights of the cars, the uh, rollability, we have a, a requirement that each car must roll on a 2% grade freely. We have a way of rating our locomotives that uh, we can tell how many units or cars the locomotive will be able to pull up our grades. Uh, we have, basically we have a, a ruling grade of 1.5%, but we do have a segment of track that's 2% and uh, we need to know how many cars those locomotives are pulled so they don't stall on the railroad. The structure that impresses me most is uh, our steel plant. It's an amazing structure. It's an entire thing. It probably occupies about 14 feet. And uh, it's got the burners and the, all of the buildings that are required there. Oh, we have the uh, petroleum plant a refinery and a refinery plant. And uh, those are located at Gary and at Colton. The control tower at Alhambra is a, an exact replica of the Barstow Tower that Santa Fe has out at Barstow. The roundhouse at Aztec, which is, it serves both ends of the railroad, is a real large structure and it's uh, real neat. But our future plans are, are completing the work that's in progress now. We have three branch lines, uh, none of which are totally complete. The one that's nearest completion is the coal branch. Uh, the second one that will be coming up will be the logging branch. And then the third one will be the ore branch, which supplies ore for the, the uh, steel mill and all the other industries on the railroad. I strongly doubt that the Sierra Pacific will ever be completed. Way back when our country fell in love with trains, this is what they looked like. And this is what they sounded like. The experience is still very much alive at the Kentucky Railway Museum here in New Haven. It's a history linked to key events in our history as a country. During the Civil War, New Haven was home to a church seized by the Confederates and used as a hospital. This rail line cut through the heart of a lot of the action during the war. The Sherwood Hotel, which sits next to the rail line, was built by Errol Johnson's grandfather in the 1870s. At the time, this was a town split by the war between the states, but also a town that managed to stay together. Kentucky was neutral. So, like my grandfather, he chose the Union side, so he had to go to Indiana to be sworn in. Uh, Mr. Hagen, his friend, all south of here, Bowling Green, all Confederate. He goes to Bowling Green, he's sworn in the Confederate Army in Bowling Green. Well, just like the, the picture, there's uh, my grandfather and Mr. Hagen. My grandfather was a con uh, Union man, Mr. Hagen was a Confederate man. Uh, they're both in the same battle at Chickamauga. Mr. Hagen doesn't have a hand there, he lost a hand at the Battle of Chickamauga. They're both in the same battle. My grandfather has a a crippled arm, he was wounded to Battle of Stones River. This is an 1898 picture. After the war, they're still bosom buddies. It's like nothing never happened. Today, it's a peaceful way to spend an afternoon. It's easy to get nostalgic about trains, and this one has a long history. On special days, you can step aboard and find all the gentility and grace of the once proud flamingo.
The Flamingo was one of the name trains of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, and it ran across this branch line on its way from Cincinnati down to Atlanta. The Railroad Museum here has recreated that in conjunction with the uh, foundation in Louisville, and we have the Flamingo Dining Trips, and the China is uh, the standard railroad white china. All the accoutrements, the salt and pepper shakers, the sugar bowls, the creamers, and so forth, are all logoed with the LNN logo, much as it was in the 1930s and 40s. Out the window, you see the countryside pretty much the way it was all those years ago. The 22-mile round trip wanders through the rolling Fork River Valley. Out the window, it's a Kentucky where you can almost picture another era, one where this wasn't just a way to travel, but the way to travel, steam. Steams are fascinating for a lot of people because they, in effect, live and breathe. When the steam engine fires up, it puffs, it huffs, much like people do. You can actually see the steam coming out of the cylinders, and it shows how the engine is working. And it has the noise to it, it has the whistle sounds, it brings back lots of memories for the older people, but for the younger people who have not grown up around steam, it still shows very much how things work and how steam locomotives work. And it's a living creature. It lives and breathes right here for you in the heart of Kentucky. One of the best uh, concoctions that I think I've uh, come up with and found out about for making ground or something that looks like ground is a, uh, a mixture of uh, materials that I call ground goop, and it's made up of the following things. It's made up of one part of celluclay, one part vermiculite, one part flat household interior latex paint, and a half a part of white glue. And just to prevent mold or mildew from growing on the stuff, if it's kept for any period of time, I add one capful of liquid Lysol and we come up with a material that looks something like this. And let me show you how easy it is to use. I'm applying the ground goop at this time, and I will apply it in about a foot to a foot and a half square area, about an eighth of an inch thick. One of the beauties of ground goop is that it's slow drying time. It will, uh, you can leave it for an hour or two, go back, and just pick up where you left off. And even when it's stored, if it's stored in an airtight container, it will uh, last indefinitely. I've had some that's been in an airtight container now for about two years, just uh, simply mixing it up, maybe adding a little water to the con con consist. If, you, uh, if it has started to dry a bit, a few more drops of uh, liquid Lysol, and it's, you're right back in business again. Once this is applied and you've covered the area you want to cover, you can immediately add the rest of your scenic materials. So you can start from start to finish. You're, you're not limited by having to wait for a certain amount of drying time or for something to dry or set up before you can start out on the next step of the project. This is about the uh, amount of area I would cover with the ground goop before I went on and started applying my additional ground cover. 
that would consist of my grasses, some dried leaves, ground up dried leaves, different texture materials, some real dirt that will be applied to create the look of dirt on the forest floor, smaller shrubs that will be added within the forest underneath the larger trees, and then some of our larger trees that will be applied to finish things up. And also I will apply some smaller rocks that will be spread inside the woods. The first thing you'll want to do after the goop is applied is spread some dirt around on the, on the forest floor. We can use a spoon to do that. And this can be sort of textures of dirt. It doesn't have to be fine sand or whatever. You can put whatever you want on there. If you have some stones that are sticking up a bit too high, just press them down in the goop. And just cover it with the material until you're happy with the effect. And if you want to place a larger stone or a larger rock somewhere on the hillside, just pick one that you like using a little liquid white glue. I, use, I prefer Elmer's. Apply that to the bottom of the stone and press the stone right in place. You can apply some different textures of grass to the scene. Textures and colors, vary your texture, vary your color. And uh, somewhere along the line, you may want to hit this, even though there is glue in the, in the ground goop, I like to hit the scene with a mixture of five parts water and one part matte medium. And that will help things adhere. Once you've applied that, you'll notice that it will wash some of the dirt down into place and you'll start to see some of the goop show through and we'll apply some smaller shrubs and undergrowth underneath the larger trees. I use Woodland Scenics uh, fine leaf foliage and I use Scenic Express uh, super trees to create this effect. You just dip them in a little white glue and press them in place and you just now we'll also add some small sticks to the forest floor to look like deadfall trees that have fallen over and deteriorated over the years and I'd like to add a little glue to these items too before I put them in place and I just press them in place here and there Now we, uh, we've created the floor of the forest, and now we want to show the, the trees themselves. We want to the, uh, create the trees themselves. So we'll pick the tree that we want to plant. We'll have to get ourselves some glue first to tip the tree into glue before we put it into the ground goop and the foam. We're going through the goop into the foam. That's the, the secret. The foam will help hold the tree up. And we just pick where we want the tree, jab ourselves a little hole down through the, through the goop into the foam and just put our tree in place and press it home. And we just keep going, adding the trees of different types. And we just keep adding trees as thick or as thinly as we please until we're happy with the, uh, the final look. We're going to move over to our rock outcropping area and I'm going to show you how ground goop can work around that rock and how we apply some ground cover over the top of the goop to give that a look of uh, an actual rock outcropping and show some of the materials and the, uh, the uh, stones and whatever that would be falling away from the thing as, uh, as time went on in a, in a real situation. First we just apply our goop around the perimeter of the rock. We're just finishing up our, our ground goop and now I'm going to show you some uh, techniques for doing some finishing ground cover around our rock outcropping to make, look, make it look like it uh, really belongs where it is. And what we do is I've, as I said before, this is a real rock 
And at the time I picked up the rock, I also picked up some dirt and material right around the same area, which matches it in color. And it's again, it's various textures. And we're just going to apply this around the rock outcropping, especially up underneath the base of it. And I'd like to use some coarser texture material here. And it kind of gives the look of portions of the rock outcropping that have deteriorated and fallen off uh, as nature has played its, its game in this area and taken its toll on the outcropping. And then we just apply that around, the, around our rock. And once we're happy with the, the look, again, we'll take our matte medium and water mixture and just apply that. And there we have it. Here we have a rock uh, outcropping similar to the uh, one I've done on another scenery segment. And it's uh, in place with the ground cover applied underneath and around it. And we've used, uh, I have used uh, Woodland Scenic's uh, finely foliage and Scenic Express super tree material to create the look of weeds and high growing uh, weeds and uh, whatnot around the perimeter of the forest. And as we, uh, we see here on a uh, diorama I did for my uh, book, Scenery, uh, Basic Scenery for Model Railroads, I've used the same uh, Woodland Scenics Finely Foliage and Scenics Express Supers trees to create the underbrush that you'll find along the edge of the woods in real life. I've also used a material available from Scenic Express called uh, Sillflower to create the look of high grass that's grown along the sides of the tracks, between the tracks and the woods in this location. It's as easy as that. In 1952, my first American Flyer set was the K-335 work train set. And every year after that through 1957, my dad always made sure I had another American Flyer train set to add to my collection. About 1958, we packed them away, and they were packed away until about 1970 when we decided to get back into the hobby. Bob Board loved his American Flyers as a child. Now he displays that set and much more to kids of all ages at the All Aboard Railroad in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We got started again because we wanted to uh, get in back into a hobby and of course we had to model trains so we decided to put a display up in our home and I went down to the hobby shop to get more track and that's when I found out American Flyer was no longer in business. Bob Board didn't let that stop him. He combed the stores, the magazines, and became a member of Train Collectors of America. Now he owns a more than impressive collection of American Flyer. I probably have well over uh, 300, 400 steam engines in my collection. I uh, have well over 250 diesel engines. And there's, there's well over 2,000 individual pieces of rolling stock. Plus, I have all the accessories that American Flyer manufactured. Right here is uh, the 21145-080, one of the last ones ever ma manufactured. Uh, they did make this with a plastic tender. One of the things you can distinguish with the plastic tender is instead of having the metal ladder on the back, it's all molded in with the tender in plastic. Now, to our knowledge, there's only two of these in existence. I also have a action work and boom car and that is a prototype, and basically that's the only one that was ever made. It was never put into production. My favorite American Flyer set would be the Northern Pacific North Coast Limited. That's really my favorite. I think it's the most attractive set they ever manufactured. Uh, it's a very sought-after collectible today. You know, it's just, it's just probably their, one of their, their nicest pieces they've ever made. Bob obviously took care of his toys as a child. Now, he's created a layout a child of any age would love. I thought we needed a turntable to put into this display, uh, so we built one from scratch. We, uh, there was none at that time readily available for purchase, and I always wanted a turntable. 
Uh, so this turntable was fa made by using a antenna rotating motor and control and indexed. 484 Challenger, number 336 is coming onto the turntable. We're now rotating the turntable to stall number 12. Okay, number 336, ready to come off the turntable. When American Flyer made the circus train back in 1950, they also had a uh, card board cutout circus kit available or came with the circus set. Uh, they're very, very rare today because as card stock, they just don't hold up forever. And it's, it's a very nice compliment to anybody's circus train, really. AC Gilbert Company was also the manufacturer of Erector. And I thought it'd be nice to put something other than just the trains in that they manufactured, like an erector set bridge. And that's why uh, I decided to build this. And it did take three eight and a half erector sets to put it together. The all aboard layout runs about 800 square feet. It measures 46 by 24 on three levels. And Bob can operate as many as 15 trains at any given time, all by himself. I've had uh, a number of, uh, especially Line L collectors and operators, visit us uh, during the holiday season. And of course, this is all American Flyer. And it's very, very difficult to find a major American Flyer display in full operation. And when they see this in operation, uh, they usually make the remark, boy, you know, I've never seen American Flyer run like this or this well. <laughs> Bob's enthusiasm for trains is his business. He operates a store that's been in the family for several decades. Here's uh, one of the new American Flyer cars, and it's uh, a Rath Packing. But whether it's for business or pleasure, the All Aboard Railroad is a collector's dream. In Dream Plan Build Volume 2, Tom Lung talked about how to build laser cut wood kits. Now let's take a look at some ways you can enhance your wood structures through weathering. The first technique is to use a stain. There are many commercial stains available that you can use, but you can also make your own at home using India ink and alcohol. All you have to do is get some 70% isopropyl alcohol and two tablespoons of India ink, which is available at most craft stores. You can go ahead and use a wide brush just like this and just dip it into your stain, grab your part, and just apply it across the wood going with the grain. And you can put on as much or as little as you like. If you want to get an effect so it looks like really old worn out wood, you can apply two or three coats to help you know, give the illusion of weathered wood. Or if you want it to look like the wood's only been exposed to the elements for a short while, you can just apply one coat. And you just go ahead and keep working like that until all your parts are covered. Now sometimes you may have problems with the wood parts warping after the stain's been applied. In that case, just put it under a heavy book like a dictionary and let it set overnight and then the parts will be straight and ready to assemble the structure. And it's also important that you apply the stain before you assemble the kit because any glue that comes out, whether you use CA or wood glue, will prevent the stain from penetrating the wood and you'll have spots of natural raw wood instead of weathered wood. Now that you have your building stained, the next step is to prepare it for painting and further weathering. A technique that I like to use and has been used by modelers for many years is rubber cement. And the purpose of rubber cement is to mask the stained wood in preparation for painting. And the rubber cement will mask off the small areas and it'll simulate paint chipping off of boards. Now here's the building already assembled and we'll just go ahead and apply the rubber cement with an old paintbrush. And it looks most prototypical to cover just a few boards at a time. You don't want to cover large sections. The goal is to simulate paint flaking off of individual boards. So once you have your brush loaded up, you just go ahead and apply it in. And the one thing with this rubber cement is it's a little stringy, so you want to make sure that you get the strings 
wiped away from your work area before you apply the paint. And you just go ahead in a random pattern and apply the rubber cement around the building until you feel that you have the areas you want covered covered. Now that the rubber cement is dried and you've painted your building, you can go ahead and remove the mask. Here's a building that's already been painted and you can see already where I've removed a few spots of the rubber cement. So I'll just go ahead and look for some spots. It's a little tricky, but if you hold the building at a proper angle and catch a light, you can see where the rubber cement masks have been applied. So you just go ahead and you can press, press onto the wood fairly hard to get the, the uh, rubber cement removed. Here you can see the uh, mask coming off and the stained wood coming through. You can just keep working back and forth like that. Now one, one thing I've experienced, particularly with the lighter colors, is that sometimes the eraser will tend to leave a little bit of a pink haze on the white paint around the wood. So what I like to do is just take a little piece of this Scotch scuff pad here, available at any hardware store, and just go over the area lightly. And what that does is that'll clean off any of the residue created by the eraser. And as you can see, that looks very realistic. You know, and, and actually that scuff pad, what it does is it helps smooth out the, the uh, area between the stained wood and the painted building so you don't have as harsh of a ridge there. And it helps make it look a little more natural. Now let me show you another technique for weathering wood. It's also very effective. And it's using this burnishing tool. Depending on the degree of weathering, you can have the bristles close like this, or you can extend the bristles out as far as you want to achieve a lighter weathering. So let me go ahead and demonstrate on the front of this building here. Now there will be some paint dust that will come up, so it's also good practice to have a dust mask on just to make sure you're not breathing any of the paint particulates in. And just go ahead, work with the grain, that's the important thing. You don't want to go against the grain. And just keep applying pressure and you'll start to see here the paints lifting off. And again, it's important to work with the pattern of the uh, clapboard siding here. You don't want to start going against it, otherwise you'll, you'll damage the uh, pattern in the wood. And as you can see, the paint's coming off quite nicely here. When I have the bristles dialed back, you're starting to see raw wood again. So that's going to be a bit of a problem because you've already stained it. Well, to solve that problem, just go ahead and apply another coat of the India ink. Now, on the back of the building, I've already done that. And that the India ink serves two purposes here. It hides that raw wood that, we, that we've exposed with the distressor, and it also helps to mute out the white paint, helping blend in the paint and the weathered wood. You'll notice that I haven't used a distressor brush on the cardstock trim pieces or on the door. And the reason for this is because the distressor would just chew these pieces up. You know, they're not designed to be aggressively weathered. For these portions of the building, use powder pastels, an airbrush with thin paint in it, or just a thin wash of paints to help blend these portions of the building in to what we've already weathered. Now here's a finished building that I've used the distressor brush on. As you can see, I've worked along here taking paint off a little bit around the windows, around the door. And I just made my way around the building, lightly weathering it. And one thing you'll notice is that I didn't weather as aggressively under the roof line here. And that's because elements such as rain and the sunlight aren't going to hit the building in those areas as directly. So the weathering's not going to be as harsh. And little things like that you want to look for on your buildings. If you have a roof overhang or if you have an awning, you want to make sure that those portions of the building don't get weathered as heavily. The techniques I've shown you here, the India ink wash, the rubber cement mask, and the distressor weathering tool, are just three ways among many that you can use to weather your buildings. But no matter what technique you use to weather your wood structures, they'll all go a long way in enhancing the realism of your kits. Clouds of steam and steel wheels on steel rails can only mean one thing, the train's coming. In Utah's Heber Valley, the lonesome whistle is a regular thing to hear.
But these days, there's nothing regular about being able to step aboard an old steam train. And that's why they come. Well, they're, they're not making any steam engines anymore. Um, uh, railroading is, is uh, mostly freight hauling, as, as, except for Amtrak, there's very few uh, really true passenger trains. But uh, Utah is a state that is, uh, is famous for the railroads, uh, the, the Golden Spike in 1869. All and this, uh, this railroad is over 100 years old. And so it's a matter of not only entertaining the people, but it's preserving history. Uh, we, can, we, we preserve what, uh, what is left because we can't, it'll never be again. It's gone forever if we lose it. It would be a shame to lose this. The place wouldn't be the same without old 75 built by Baldwin in Philadelphia way back in 1907. I like to think of a locomotive much as, or, or similar to a human being, in that it has a style, a personality, and it changes from day to day, just like we as humans change from day to day. Atmospheric conditions, uh, types of coal, type of water, uh, the type of people you have running the locomotive will cause it to change and act differently than it would with different conditions. The neat thing about this locomotive is, with the right conditions, right day, good coal, good atmospheric conditions, and a good crew, wonderful engine to run. You get an imbalance somewhere, anywhere, in any one of the equations, whole day can go straight to nowhere. And uh, it's one of those things that you work with it, and you try to learn what it wants, you give it what it wants, and as you give the locomotive what it wants, you'll find out that it'll give you what you want. Unlike a human, her heart is made of iron and runs on coal. She's stoked and primed by men who still call railroading their way of life. Like her, they're living reflections of a different time, a portion of history that only lives on in a few notches of America, spots like here in the Heber Valley. It's a ride to savor and remember. We'll leave Heber City and we'll go across the farmlands of the Heber Valley. Uh, there's a number of uh, alfalfa fields. You'll see some cattle out in the fields as well. Uh, we'll come around an area called Soldier Hollow. That's the, uh, the, the Olympic venue of cross-country skiing and the biathlon for 2002. Then we'll follow the lakeshore of Deer Creek Lake for about five miles. And along that lake, uh, you'll find uh, a desert scenery, a sagebrush. And when we get to uh, Deer Creek Dam, we'll descend into the canyon on a 4% grade. And we'll go into uh, a pine and aspen-filled uh, canyon. It's absolutely spectacular in the fall. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's just nice to get around. And, uh, and we'll follow the river, Provo River, for about uh, five or six miles until we get to uh, Vivian Park. Vivian Park is where we stop and turn around, and that's a, that's a trout pond, uh, pavilion, uh, children's playground area. It's, it's quite nice, and uh, people spend about 30 minutes down there before we turn around and come back. These rails, coaches, and the 75 are movie stars. They've been in 31 feature films, including A River Runs Through It and the TV show Touched by an Angel. For some reason, the magic of the railroad is coming back into, into fashion. So you see them in commercials. Um, Touched by an Angel has used us a number of times. And uh, I just think it's a, it's a, a, a unique, uh, interesting, uh, something different for the film companies. For a time, it looked like this old line was lost. When they turned it into a tourist line, there wasn't much to it. Well, uh, we started with basically nothing. Uh, when we fir first started in 1992, we had a 618 and we had an MW2 uh, diesel locomotive, a 1939 diesel. And what we've acquired in the, in the last eight years has been pretty phenomenal. Uh, we now have uh, five locomotives, uh, three diesels, uh, two steam engines. We have uh, the railroad cars that were in uh, uh, a river runs through it, uh, along with a number of other freight cars. We have our maintenance away equipment. We have one car called the Molly Brown. It's uh, a car that was, it's a wooden coach built in 1890 and purported to be uh, the private coach of the unsinkable Molly Brown at one time. So we can't prove it, but it's a great story. 75 is rolling up on the century mark. A lot of folks ask how long she'll last. John says the old 75 has a lot more good years in her. I think that steam technology is only getting better, not getting worse. And a lot of people will argue that point. Well, the old guys that did this back in the day are dying off. Well, us new kids that are coming up have some new tricks in the bag. And we've learned some new things. And we have some things that we can apply to the old locomotives. And it's causing them to last longer and run better. And what better place to run than through Utah's rugged country, 
on a line that moves you forward and takes you back at the same time. We've reached the end of the line for this edition. We hope you've enjoyed the ride. We'll have more layouts, prototypes, and how-to tips next time, and more fun with the world's greatest hobby in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Welcome to the Dream, Plan, Build video series. In this collection, you'll see amazing layouts of fellow modelers, some of the most interesting trains and railroads around, and plenty of tips and techniques to make your time at the workbench and at the throttle more productive and a lot more fun. We'll travel across America in search of layouts we all dream of operating and get inside the heads of their builders as they describe how they designed and built their prized railroads. Plus, whether you're running a 4x8 or a 40x80 operation, You'll discover tips and techniques to make your rolling stock run smoother and look more realistic.